All right, good morning. We have finished the book of Daniel, and after the summer, we're going to step into Titus and Timothy. Right now, we're just kind of doing some messages from the heart. Last week, obviously, was uh, Father's Day. And today, I want to talk about kind of how God uses pictures and symbols in the Scripture. There's a lot of places that he does this. Uh, Hebrews, for instance, uh, God talks about the Word of God. He says it's, it's like milk. He said some of you should be eating solid food, but instead you're, you're still on the milk of the Word. He, he, he illustrates the Scripture like a sword. He says... Uh, the word of God is living, it's powerful. And he says, this is the image, this is the picture. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrows. So, so all through scripture you see God using symbols and, and pictures. Uh, Jesus would do it. He would say, consider the lilies of the field or the birds of the air. And uh, he, he would want people to realize that God can care for you, that he does care for you, and talks about trust and alliance. God uses a rainbow to, to make a promise that he'd never flood the earth again. So there's all kinds of examples, there's all kinds of imagery in the scripture, and one I want to draw your attention to is, is in a book that maybe this verse you've never paid much attention to. But it's out of the book of Leviticus, and I'm sure you do all your devotional life in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 23, there, there is a verse, and uh, of course Leviticus is all about laws that regulate sacrifices and duties of the priest. It, it's a book that deals with the holy calendar and rituals and a, a life that's to be lived in a certain way. But there's this verse in chapter 23, verse 40, that says, You shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, bows of leafy and trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So, Lord, as we take a look at this picture of the palm and the willow, uh, would you give us uh, ears to hear and hearts to receive? And Lord, just uh, help us to hear what you're saying to us as a church and individually. Uh, speak to us by your word. We, we ask that. We pray that in Jesus' name. Well, the palm, obviously, is a picture of that which is standing upright in the sun. The willow droops. And at times is even called the weeping willow. The contrast is intentional and it's very purposeful. One is a symbol of gladness, victory, rejoicing. The other, the willow, is one of sadness. It's one of weakness. It's one of sorrow. For, for the Israelites, it would be one of exile. There's a lesson, a teaching for us in this picture, in this text. First, the palm and the willow are a part of everybody's human experience. My, my mother once owned a florist shop with, a, with another partner here in Gulf Breeze. It was where the Bank of America is right now in, in Gulf Breeze. And it was called Amy's Florist. And I'd be home for college and, and I many times delivered flowers for my mom. And I'll never forget such a contrast when you go into the florist shop. You can see flowers for weddings, for Mother's Day, for anniversaries, and at the same time, it would be filled with wreaths for coffins, for funerals, and you would have this contrast there in the flower shop. And many times, I, I would deliver sometimes flowers to newborns, and sometimes very sad flowers for those who had died. And life is a mixture, a constant impact of joy and grief. 
of gladness and sadness, of laughing and weeping. And there's times in life where you, you, you taste a, a sense of success. There's times when you reach goals and there's gain and, and you overcome difficulties and you win. And then there's times where it can be pretty dark. And we all have this relationship, so to speak, with both the palm and the willow. There, there's this sting of the willow. With health issues come. I mean, how many of you have ever heard of hurricanes? Any, anybody here ever hear of those around here? There's fires. The culture we live in right now is filled with all kinds of issues of shootings and loss of jobs and, and, and inflation and, and failed relationships. And all of us, the best we can, we, we, we find ourselves with our hands holding these two things. One hand may be a palm, the other a willow. Isaiah describes it like this in chapter 15, verse 7. He, he says... Uh, are those guys awake? Oh, there Therefore, <laughs> this could have been a big willow. Uh, therefore, the abundance they have gained and what they have laid up, well, they'll carry away to the brook of the willow. Sometimes you gain a lot and then you lose a lot. It's real. There's loss. There's broken hearts. There's hurt. There's rejection. Joy and sorrow are both a real part of life. There's bitter, there's sweet, there's youth, there's old age, there's pleasure, there's pain, there's sun, there's rain. This is what this picture is saying. This is what this image is revealing to us. And, and there's no one, please listen, there's no one who escapes. There's no one who's immune. We only think they do. We only think everybody else's life is going great and I got to go through this or that. And all things come with a price tag. Success and accomplishment is never an accident. There's work, there's labor, there's mistakes, there's exhaustion, there's joy and sorrow that's always intermingled together. See, Facebook and Instagram, it's not so real. All you see is the good stuff. Why don't we post some of the bad stuff to make us feel a little better? It's mixed together. We smile, we sigh. The palm is in one hand, the willow in the other. All through scripture you see this. Job saw it. David saw it. Slaying a, a, a giant and then running and hiding in the caves of En Gedi from King Saul. Paul, the apostle, knew what it was like to be uh, powerful in the Lord. And then the next thing you know, he shipwrecked on an island. You could, you could take a helicopter and go above the city of Pensacola and look down. And over here, you might see people at the Wahoo Stadium, loving life, enjoying a game. And over here, you've got the Baptist Hospital. They're both in the same city. Or, or some Phrase it like this, comedy and tragedy are on the same stage over and over again. Politics and culture at times seem out of control. And it's our duty, it's our privilege, so to speak, to bring before the Lord both the palm and the willow. They're part of our lives. Listen to it again, and you shall take for yourselves... On the first day, the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palms, bows of leafy, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You know, I'm thankful and grateful for the pleasant, for beautiful places. You know, yesterday we took a couple of our grand kids out on, Len and I own this little boat. And if you own a boat, you know the palm and the willow, right? It's, it's, it's inevitable <laughs> if you have a boat. So, so we took them out, and, and we drove past Portofino and down to the National Seashore and pulled the boat up on the beach, and, and, and it was just beautiful, gorgeous. You could walk along uh, uh, this little 
two-year-old little girl, we walked way down the beach, and I was with a bunch of them just walking, and, and I, suddenly I feel this, someone grab my finger. And I look, it's this little two-year-old, blonde hair, blue-eyed girl going, I walk with you, Pop. I walk with you. I go, doesn't get much better than that. There, there, there's, there's the good, there's the bad. I'm thankful for God's blessing and life's joys. And, and, and please listen, they should never be taken for granted. The palm tree can change to a willow in a second, in an accident, a stroke, cancer. Prayer and connection with the Lord and keeping a heart of gratefulness is primary in life. It's the Lord who gives life. He gives health. He gives blessing. Job said it this way. Through all he experienced and all he had and all he trafficked through, he said, hey, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We praise him for life and love and friendship and eyesight and hearing. Uh, the table uh, even gets spread before us in the presence of our enemies. It's just the way life is. And it's easy to be a grump, a complainer. It's difficult to be grateful. You know, as, as we're trafficking through this time in our life, this season, we've got these 14 grandkids that all live right around us, and they, they come through our house at times like a horde of locusts, and they're, 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 they're everywhere. They're, they're in the refrigerator. Uh, they've got dirty feet on the couch. They have no concept. And, and Lynn's always saying to me, my wife's always saying to me, John, don't be grumpy. Don't be that guy. Yeah, but, yeah, but. No, don't, don't be that guy. It's easy to be that guy, a complainer. It's better to be someone who's grateful. Nobody wants to hang out with a griper, a nitpicker, someone who's always looking for the problem. There will be a time to weep, a time of grieving, a time of sorrow, they come into everybody's life. I, I mean, take it from me, a guy who's been, been doing this for 40 years. When, when I first started the church, I'll never forget, we hadn't had our first building built yet. We're over here in Oriole Beach Elementary School, and we're just about to get the first building up. And four doors down from me lived one of my best friends at that time, and he played worship. He helped with small groups, and, and he got sick. He had four children. And he died. It was the first funeral I'd ever done in my life. And it was hard. It was a difficult time. God, God why? What, what are you doing? And I have had the unfortunate privilege and honor of doing my own mother's funeral, my stepdad's funeral, my stepsister's funeral, my, my, my real sister's funeral, my brother Yancey's funeral, some of my best friends, saved and unsaved, and I could go on and on and on. And, and life is full of that. And, and, and you don't wave the palm over your own head. You wave it before the Lord. And, and it's not about me. It's not about you. You don't toss it on the, your, before your own feet, your own path. Remember the source of all blessing and grace and goodness. It, it's him. And you wave it before the Lord. Both the good and the bad. And when trials and hardships come, life does have downers. It does have disappointments. But difficulty produces something. There's a message many times in pain and struggle. It, it took a thorn in the flesh for the Apostle Paul to say, it kept me from being elevated, to be humble. Stephen, that first martyr in the church, the, the, they literally stoned him outside the city of Jerusalem. And as he's dying, as he's being stoned, he looked up and said, the heavens are parted. I see one as a son of man standing. Daniel was in a den of lions, and God was very, very close. Peter failed, and he denied the Lord. But I think it prepared his heart. 
and in a humble way on, 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 on the day of Pentecost when he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, he stood reinstated by the Lord himself, preached, and 3,000 people came into the church that day, and it was born. Prison, abandoned by his own family, sold into slavery. Joseph rises up to be second in command of one of the most powerful nations in the world at that time, Egypt, and he was the gateway for the people of God to be saved from famine. God was doing something. Jesus uh, revealed to us there's glory in the cross. So, so we wave before the Lord, both the palm, both the willow. And listen, the Lord is just as good to you when he gave one as when he allowed the other. He is. He opens, he shuts, he fires, he hires, he gives, he takes, we seek his grace in the palm, and we seek it in the willow. Many people are proud and awkward in victory. So many are sour and difficult in defeat. It's not easy to carry the palm of opulence or wealth. You can become entitled, think you're special, lose kindness and simplicity, reserve parking places for yourself. You have to be careful and always remember that for the grace of God, there go I. Amen. You need grace to carry the palm and the willow. You can become a downer. You can become a martyr, disagreeable, poor me, always a chip on the shoulder, hard to smile when things seem to always be against you. One of the toughest lessons of all of life is to learn how to be a good loser because we all lose at times. You don't win every time. And I don't, I, I don't know which takes more grace, the joyous or the bitter. Every job is difficult. Every marriage has a challenge. Don't say amen if your spouse is sitting next to you. <laughs> every marriage is a challenge. Every lesson can be learned or postponed. Every age you're in has its pros and its cons. You remember when you were young? Oh, I can't wait till I get older. Oh, I can't wait till I get now. Now you're old. Oh, God, I wish I was young. You know, it never changes. Every age has its pros and cons. And we all walk through that. God has established a balance. The palm and the willow. They're both real. The story is told about a, a single dad who was raising a young girl, a young daughter, and he called her his little angel. He came home one afternoon, and uh, he had uh, found the kitchen. He had spent hours cleaning it and organizing it, and he walked in, and it was a total wreck. His daughter had been cooking, and the ingredients were scattered everywhere. All over the kitchen were dirty bowls, utensils, the sink was full of spoons, and uh, there were prints all over the refrigerator, and, and he, was, he, was, he was uptight. And then he saw a note on the table. It was kind of had smeared chocolate hand prints, fingerprints on it, and it was very brief. It said, I'm making, M-A-K-I-N, something, S-U-M-T-H-I-N, for you, signed, your angel. And in the middle of the mess, and despite his irritation, he suddenly felt a sense of gratitude and joy as his attention was now on his daughter, not the mess. He loved that little girl so much. He thought about how hard she had worked and what she was doing. And, and many times, listen, life is messy. It can get hard. And you can't find a lot of things sometimes in your circumstances to be happy about. But if you wait, and if you look, he's working in you through these circumstances. He's making something for you. He's making something in you. He, he cares. He knows. He, he, he draws near. Yea, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. 
Thou art with me. Some of the most difficult times in my life have been some of the best when I look back and I see what God was doing. In them, in me, and through them. I got, I got radically saved at 18, went back to high school, finished high school, didn't know what I was going to do, ended up going to Bible college. I was a new convert. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I just knew I felt God was leading me to go to Bible college. So for four years, I go to Bible college down in Lakeland, Florida. I meet my wife, Lynn, get out of Bible college. I got my Bible. I know the Bible now, kind of, and I think everybody's going to want me to be their pastor. <laughs> of course they will. So I'm sending out resumes everywhere, and I'm getting the same response. Thank you so much for your wonderful resume. We will keep it on file if anything opens up in our area. Guess what? Nothing was opening up in any area. So I get a job in a cabinet shop here in Gulf Breeze. And I thought, Jesus was a carpenter. What a great way to start. <laughs> well, I, I can't shoot a nail gun straight. I'm trying to build cabinets and with these other three guys and we're at this little cabinet shop over here and, and I would be putting them together and nails are flying across the room and people are ducking and finally the owner comes to me and he goes, you know, maybe you're better at installing. What's that? Well, you hold the heavy stuff while everybody else screws it to the wall. So I'm no longer working in the cabinet shop. I'm just there when they are delivering and installing. I got tired of being the grunt guy. So I got a job at a lighting store over in Pensacola. It was a big warehouse where they sold lights to contractors for homes that were being built. And it was me and one other guy up in a warehouse in the middle of the summer, and it was not air conditioning, and it was upstairs. It was a nightmare. You're putting together all, all these lights, hanging ones down in the display, and, and, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't last long there. So then I thought, with all my wisdom, someone offered me a job. They were opening up a donut shop in Gulf Breeze. Right across from where Bank America is now, there's a little uh, building, blue building there now that's a daycare. Well, originally it was built for a donut shop, Granny's Old Fashioned Donuts. So I took the job. I, me and one other guy, he owned it. He would make the donuts. I would fry, glaze, and fill the donuts. I knew I wanted to go into ministry, and the word fryer is kind of a word used for ministry, but <laughs> that was not the term I was looking for. So I would get up every morning at 2.30. I lived on Shirley Avenue, right in these little duplexes, Lynn and I our first place together. We only had one car. So I would ride my bicycle from Shirley Avenue, cross Highway 98 to the little donut shop every morning, two thirty, five, six days a week, covered in glaze after every day. One morning I'm up riding my bike, 2.30 in the morning to the donut shop. I'm halfway there and I hear this whoop, whoop, whoop. I'm like, there's a cop pulling me over. Bike up, <laughs> get off. I go, what's up? He goes, where are you headed? <laughs> I got a donut shop right over there. He goes, mm-hmm. <laughs> Why? I go, I work there. He goes, where'd you get the bike? <laughs> I said, in my backyard. He goes, you have a good day. But, but I, I would go in, I would make the donuts, you know, I'd work from like 3, 2.30 to, to noon. My brother Yancey, who was a surfer on the surf shop, he'd come by sometimes around 6 or 7, get himself a donut and a cup of coffee, go, hey, is John back there? Yeah, he's back there. I'd come out all covered in glaze, like, <laughs> surf's good. <laughs> I'd go, yeah, I'm sure it is, I'm sure it's good. <laughs> you want to go out when you get off work? I get off at noon. And then I'm so tired, my, my wife gets off from work at a bank, she's a teller, and, and she wants me to take a nap so we can have a little time together. He goes, yeah, but it's offshore, and it's perfect. So sometimes I would go surfing right after, he'd pick me up, and when Lynn would get home, I'd be like, yeah. 
she goes, you've been surfing, have you? No, no, I didn't go surfing. <laughs> I, did, I did that for about, I don't know how long, seemed like eternity. And one day, Lynn and I were having a heart, a heart talk about life. And she looked at me and she said, I did not marry a donut maker. I said, I know, how did this happen? <laughs> So I called one of my professors from the Bible college, and I started telling him about my life and what I was doing. He goes, John, John, you're, 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 you were a new convert. He goes, you need to go to seminary. I said, I don't know if I, I could afford it. I don't know if I could get accepted. He said, well, there's a seminary. I know quite a few of these professors. It's a Baptist seminary. It's in Kansas City, Missouri. I'll give you a great recommendation. Go ahead and apply. So I did, and I got accepted. And I remember walking into the donut shop to my boss, he was also the owner, and said, you know, I applied for seminary. I've been accepted, so I want to give, I'm going to be going, I'm going to be leaving in a month. And he just stopped dead in his tracks, and he looked at me, and he goes, I feel like two prisoners, and you just got paroled. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. So we went to Kansas City, Missouri. I don't recommend Kansas City, Missouri to anybody. It's hot in the summer. It's freezing cold in the winter. And the day I was leaving, I'll never forget, we had this little Toyota Corolla. We had the largest uh, little trailer behind this U-Haul that you could barely fit a couch in. I had $1,000 in my pocket. And we were headed to Kansas City. My brother Yancey came by to say goodbye, pulled up in his van with his surfboards and all that. He gets out, and I'm standing there saying goodbye to my mom. I'm at my mom's house. And Yancey goes, John, do you know where Kansas City is? I goes, yeah. He goes, it's in the middle of the United States. There's no surf there at all. I go, yeah, I know. I <laughs> checked it out. He goes, are you you're crazy? So off we went. But it was, it was a great time. Lynn and I had only been married for nine months. It was a great time for us to solidify our relationship. We had to make all new friends together. There was no family. There was no, there was just her and I working it out there in Kansas City. I graduated three years later. Lynn actually finished college there. And we moved back here. And two years later, planted this church. Started off in Oriel Beach Elementary. And, and I'll have to say this. After that, everything was a piece of cake. Nothing ever went wrong. <laughs> Nobody ever complained. All these buildings just sprung out of the ground. It, it, it was so simple. Uh, people always agreed with everything I said and did. Lynn and I have a perfect marriage, perfect kids, never had a problem with our kids. Everything was amazing. Just like your life. <laughs> and, and through all of that, and still to this day, I can say this. He was making something. In me, in you, in us. He's always doing that. And, and I keep learning it's not about me. It's about him. And all the difficulties and all the good things that come our way and life is blended through those. You take the palm, you take the willow, and you bring them before the Lord and say, Lord, I trust you. I celebrate what you're doing. I don't always agree with it, but Jesus knew the palm. He knew the willow. Palm Sunday led him to a crown of thorns and a bloody cross. He stood there looking over Jerusalem, weeping, knowing what was ahead. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you like a mother hen gathers its chicks, but you would not. And, and our most palmy days, if I could say it that way, the most wonderful days in our life, our, our future, so to speak, well, they're, they're in front of us. We look forward to this place called heaven. We look forward to this land where the palm, so to speak, is always bright, where, where every tear is, is wiped away. I'll read this passage to you. You know it. It says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They'll be his people. He himself will be with them. 
He dwells with them. He's with them, and he'll be their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And here's a wonderful part. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more grumps, no more nitpickers, no more weeping. God himself will wipe away every tear. The former things will have passed away. And he who sits on the throne says, I'll make all things new. And he said to me, write these things. These words are true and they're faithful. And he said to me, it's done. I'm, I'm the alpha, the mega, the beginning and the end. And I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son or daughter. Every tear is wiped away. And in the midst of this journey that we call life, we all have the palm. We all have the willow. And we all have the wonderful decision and privilege to make to bring them before the Lord and rejoice before him and trust him. He is making something. To, to learn how to, how to navigate, you know, as, as, as you guys have gotten older, I, I've not got that much older. <laughs> One thing I've noticed, though the outer man may be perishing, the inner man is renewed day by day. It's such an amazing thing. And may, maybe if you're a little older, you might feel like I do. You think, you, you look in the mirror and you go, I'm having an okay hair day, but I'm getting older. But I don't feel older inside. I feel the same. And I think part of that has to do with the great hope and the great privilege we have of knowing that we never really die. Oh, we transition. And there's difficulties and hardships in life. And America is facing a lot of them right now. But as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I encourage you, I encourage myself. Let's bring them before the Lord and learn to trust and rejoice in him. And to take this cue from the book of Leviticus to, to, to take them both. You shall take for yourself the palm tree and the willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Lord, we, we bring it before you. My good things, my failures, my successes, my donut shop, my cabinet shop, my florist shop, all the things, Lord, that you taught me, all the things that you're teaching us. Let us bring them before you and trust you and rejoice in you because we know you're making something. It might look like a mess sometimes, but you're making something. And one day we'll stand before you. And Lord, may we do it with a rejoicing heart of who you are and trust you in the midst. No, no, nobody escapes the palm and the willow. But thank God he walks with us through both of them. And we have the wonderful, wonderful privilege of rejoicing in him.